Dr. John Cady, Distinguished Professor Emeritus of uh, History at Ohio University, uh, participated in the Institute on World Affairs this year, the topic being the role of the military in the world, 1971. Now, Dr. Cady has many things that contributed to him being a distinguished professor, part of it, I suspect, being the time that you spent in Bangkok and studying Burma, writing about many different things, but with 10 minutes, we cannot uh, hit all those. But I think there is something valuable that you can do for us briefly, and that is there is discussion, whether it be in Viet Vietnam or the other countries in Southeast Asia, that uh, elections, free elections, um, should take place. Now, this is not as easy as it may sound to most Americans. Mm -hmm. What are the problems involved? The basic problem, of course, is that we, we feel that, uh, that the present uh, governments, to be legitimate, ought to have the support of their people. And the way we would like to bring about this support is to have elections. But they don't have a whole lot of confidence in elections. This is the trouble. They, they've seen situations where elections have been rigged repeatedly, and they've seen also where in Burma uh, the military dictatorship can arise and cancel the whole constitution. And uh, Tanom Kitikacharn, the present dictator of Thailand, has done the same thing within the last three weeks. And uh, there isn't any great outcry among the people. Uh, the Burmese would like to go back to their constitution, definitely. Uh, and uh, no doubt there are some Thai who, who fear it, but um, who, who fear the results of this kind of dictatorship. But basically, except for the Filipinos, who really like elections, they make fiestas out of them and have a lot of fun. And uh, they have much more freedom of of uh, criticism than even we have in this country, really. They almost, they run wild in it. But uh, you have had elections and elections. In, in uh, Malaya, a pretty good election was held. It ended up in a terrible riot of uh, Malays against, uh, Malays against Chinese. And uh, uh, elections were held in 1955 in Indonesia. They were canceled two years later. Uh, they've had more recent election, and they've done a little bit better, but it is based on, on uh, so-called functional representation rather than regional or parties. They distrust party, party groups, and party uh, um, uh, factionalism. They never can divide into two parties uh, uh, like we do, more or less, but they have 15 or 20. One friend of mine said that in South Vietnam there are probably 60 parties. Mm. And so fractionalism, you vote your particular area, your particular situation. There's not enough experience with elections or with political activity to make them really have any confidence in them. Now, sooner or later, uh, we have to divide orderly ways by which they can change the guard get rid of people that are hopelessly incompetent or, uh, or corrupt. But uh, it isn't easy just to say you organize a Democratic and Republican National Convention and this will solve all your problems. Uh, a fellow would be a little bit fatuous to say that in any case, I think, but it doesn't, it really doesn't work. Now, as most of the political power vested in individuals who really are uh, of a military background, or active? Well, this varies from country to country. The military does not have any influence in Malaya to speak of. The military has no influence, really, in the Philippines at the present time. The military has no influence in Singapore. Uh, and uh, perhaps uh, the military, as such, has relatively little influence in Laos. In uh, Cambodia, it's, it's, of course, in a limbo of, uh, of uh, warfare and military rule. It's hard to describe the government at all. In South Vietnam, of course, the government is almost 100 percent military. Uh, so it depends on the circumstances that you have. Usually, military rule is better than anarchy. 
and the military have the guns, and if you want to have some kind of order, you have no choice but to go to them. But it isn't any long-term answer to the problems. Sooner or later, you must recognize uh, some kind of uh, ability that grows out of ideas and competence and efficiency and public-spirited interest. How, can you, how you can uh, do this without elections is a problem. How, how you can do it with elections is a problem. Uh, we, we face perhaps uh, the latter sometimes. But uh, this, this is a long-term business, but we're going to have to go slow on this idea that just hold elections and everything will be fine. It just won't work. Well, I was going to say our, our expectations are too... Uh, uh, I started to say hi, but that's not exactly right. Perhaps they are so different that we get disappointed. And we're, we're impatient. Mm -hmm. we, we want to get things done. And after all, uh, they've lived there a long, long time, and this election idea has come in in the last few years, and uh, uh, it's the foreigner's uh, concern, and uh, we'll go along if it seems to please him and if he'll give us some money and support, but well, they have really very little confidence in it. It will take time for them to work out, but they're going to have to work out their own system of changing. Now, how much of their uh, problem is uh, the result of the... Uh, uh, colonialism and getting rid of that, and is this an adolescent period for them in government? Yeah, where, where you have the older order carry over, as in Thailand and as in the Philippines and in Malaya, the transition is fairly smooth. Uh, the move from away from colonialism or semi-colonialism to independence uh, can be handled, not, not neatly, not perfectly, but it can be handled. Where you have an entirely new group come in, as in North Vietnam or South Vietnam, uh, and uh, or in Indonesia and Burma, the situation is very difficult to stabilize. Uh, Thailand has been able to keep the functioning of its own civil service intact. They hold their allegiance to the king. The king is important, not powerful, but influential and important. The others have no kings, but the rulers in Manila or in uh, Malaya are still all sultans or sultan's sons. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, leadership, uh, the leadership in Indonesia is, uh, in the outer islands, is also based on some traditional factors. The army playing uh, an important role, however, too. So there are places where traditionalism carries over, and uh, frequently uh, it gets in the way of Bit, but it's probably better than uh, simply complete destruction of it. So you have, you have to have some idea of how you can use their tradition and their sense of values and make that modulate over till it fits what we are convinced they need and let them try to make the decision. Now this takes a good deal of finesse and you can't in, take in some American advisors and say, now this is what you have to do. It doesn't work. We've got to be much more patient and understanding than we've been as a rule. All right, now, this is uh, because we, we're going to have to quit, but now you have done some writings in this area. Now, tell me just br briefly your favorite book and uh, what's it about, because uh, it sounds good. I, uh, I think my best book probably is The History of Modern Burma, where you have, uh, where I was out in Rangoon for a full year and then uh, in London for quite a while. Uh, the book carries it clear up to the coup of 1962. I know Burma best. Mm -hmm. I, I lived there before the war. I was sent out by the State Department immediately after the war. I was there on a Fulbright Guggenheim grant in 55, 56. I have been back recently in 68. Uh, Burma is uh, my favorite country. Uh, but uh, a very exasperating place, too. But that, I think, is uh, generally recognized as the, the best book on modern Burma, and I'm very proud of it. They actually use that book in the University of Rangoon, and I'm extremely proud of that, because ordinarily the English books in English, they just rule out. At least I've convinced them that it is the best <laughs> book on Burma, and that's, that's what I'm proud of.
And our guest has been uh, Dr. John Cady. And I suspect, if his sense of humor goes through his writing at all, that the book it is a very, very readable, as well as being very good from the exact history background. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for being here. The Little Ark is opening in Des Moines with the world premiere on Wednesday of this week. That's correct. And the producer, the director, all sorts of things, happens to be Robert uh, Raditz. And uh, this is, I would say, what, number almost five or six of a very successful... This is my sixth film, yes. Sixth film and the sixth award of this particular award. Yes, this is, uh, we just found out uh, last week, this is the sixth time that uh, Parents Magazine has awarded us uh, their gold medal for the picture of the, uh, of the period. So we're very pleased about that. And of course, uh, Parents Magazine is not the only uh, organization or group that has honored your abilities in many different ways. If we spent the time going on down over the award. Well, we don't have any time left. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, I want to talk about a little bit about the uh, type of uh, concerns that, or the concerns that you have in that area. But first, tell me a little bit about the, the Little Ark. Well, The Little Ark uh, is based on a novel of Jan de Hartog's, you know, who wrote The Four mm -hmm. Poster and The Captain in the Hospital. It's a story of uh, two children during the 1953 floods, the most disastrous floods that they'd had in Holland. Uh, two children and four animals, a dog, a cat, a rabbit, and a rooster who become uh, separated from their family during the floods. Uh, and on one level, it's a story of the children's search for their family. Uh, on another level, it's a story that basically says uh, that in times of stress, what is comedic to children is horrendous to adults and vice versa. And on another level, uh, it's a film that says that in times of stress, people Human beings seem to have an ability, an affinity of working together. And then when things start to get a little bit better, we seem to fall back and fall apart again, uh, which is too bad. Uh, so the film, as well as the book, is the kind of thing that I've generally looked for with the work that I've done. And that is, I feel that it's possible to make a motion picture on a number of levels so that the adult viewing the film can enjoy it just as much as the younger person. Uh, I see no need, no necessity to talk down to young people when you're making a film for them. Um, the analogy that I like to use is that, for instance, when you know, looking at literature for a moment, uh, that when Twain wrote Huckleberry Finn, he didn't start out to say, I am now going to write a book for children. Uh, he wrote out of his own heart and out of his own mind. He didn't talk down, and consequently, a youngster can read Huckleberry Finn. You can read it again on a uh, university level, and you can read it again when you're older. Uh, I think too much so-called family fear or children's fear talks down, and I see no need for it. Well, it certainly doesn't give... That's a long answer to your question. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, that's, that's all right in the law, a longer answer, but at the same time, this doesn't give even the varied abilities and experiences of a child a, a chance to, uh, uh, to relate if you just take it to one level of children, because where are you going to find that one level? Exactly. It, it doesn't exist. Uh, I, I remember once a librarian saying something to me which I think is very applicable to what we're speaking of, and that is that uh, show me a children's book that an adult cannot pick up and enjoy, and I will show you a children's book that a child will not enjoy. And I think this is true. Uh, I think that so much of what we have, particularly on television, you know, just allows them to sit there like non-reacting sponges with nothing happening up here. It's ridiculous. It's foolish. There's no need for it.
And again, the same thing could happen in the theater, but I get terribly concerned about this in television, too, because you don't even have, then, the facial uh, expressions to respond to back and forth. And right. what happens? And if we get a batch of uh, just stone-faced individuals, it's quite possible. All right, what are some of your real concerns? In addition to this, as far as movies are concerned at the present time. Well, uh, one of the things that's concerned me uh, and, and continues to concern me, particularly today, is the whole issue of uh, sex and violence in motion pictures. Uh, although I make family films, I personally have nothing against sex and violence in a motion picture with one simple proviso, and that is that it not be gratuitous, that it not be put in there as a grabber, which is, I think, what's happening with about three quarters of the films that we're getting on our screens today. I don't believe that you can hide life from children, and I think it's a mistake to try to do so. What concerns me particularly is the gratuitous use of violence. I'm not so concerned about the sexual area. I am very concerned about the violence area. It's not that I think that necessarily a child seeing violence on the screen or on television is necessarily going to go out and shoot his father or something, although that has happened. What I am concerned about is that uh, if they see that much of it, it begins to inure them. It be they begin to accept it as a way of life. And I'm afraid, or at least in my mind, I think that in our country today, we are, be that's the greatest malaise that we have possibly, is that we are becoming inured to violence. Uh, children see so much of it on the screen. Uh, they see it in newsreels. Uh, and they have no framework of relation. Uh, and so if it's in a film, and there is a scene, a, a scene of death in this particular film, uh, hopefully it's done in taste, and hopefully it's within a framework in which they can relate. And it's in a framework from a family standpoint where they can discuss it with their family and with all their brothers and sisters or their teachers or whatever it happens to be. And for me, this is important. The other thing that I try to do in my films, uh, besides entertain, and, uh, and that word in itself is a strange word, uh, uh, you know, really, what do we mean by entertainment? Uh, entertainment for me means many things. Uh, but in the brief time we have here, entertainment for me really means involvement. Uh, are we involved with what we say? Uh, too frequently, I think we're not. We're just kind of sitting there like this, you know. Uh, I think the things that most entertain us are the things that most involve us, the things that we have to work along with uh, that aren't just spoon-fed to us so much fair of this nature is pap and suet, you know, and nothing happens up here. Uh, what I aim for as well is that it makes no difference in my films whether the story, as is, was the case in Misty, is a story of a youngster growing up in Virginia, or whether in this particular case it's a story of two Dutch children, or in my side of the mountain of a Canadian youngster, or in now Miguel, whether it be a story of uh, a Mexican-American child growing up, uh, that although these stories are particular to place and into the customs of those areas, nevertheless, uh, people seeing them in an entirely different area, for instance, an Italian child seeing uh, the story of uh, my side of the mountain can look at that and say, yes, I understand that boy. I can relate to that boy. And if he's able to do that, and if his family's able to do that, and if anyone seeing the film is able to do that, then they're able to make the other jump and say that people basically are the same the world over. And for me, this is very important in my films. Now, do you uh, film all these, in a sense, in the natural sort of uh, environment? Yes. I have shot every one of my films completely on location. I've never shot a film on a backlot studio. I've never shot a film in Hollywood. Uh, our present film, uh, Little Ark, uh, was shot completely in Holland. Uh, we 
would never have been able to shoot the film, I must say, without the enormous cooperation of the Dutch government and the Dutch Navy, because from a logistics standpoint alone, it meant flooding a whole area, recreating this terrible flood of 53. And it's, what is more violent than that? Nothing is more violent than that. Uh, and the interesting thing that happens if you shoot on an actual location is this. First of all, uh, it gives an honesty to the film. Uh, secondly, uh, from an educational standpoint, people are able to see a part of the world that they haven't seen before or frequently haven't seen before. And from a young person's standpoint, it adds another dimension, and that is this. The first question that youngsters from about the age of five to about 12 always ask when they see a motion picture I mean, I've constantly had this experience, is they always ask, is it real? Did it really happen? It's the first and foremost, because they've been tricked too often. And I'm sure that you'll enjoy the little arc, and our guest has been Robert Bradley, and I hope that he continues to do more film. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Doris.